Good evening, everyone. Welcome to 60 Minutes in Space. My name is Dimitri Klebe, and I get the pleasure of flying solo tonight here. Um, uh, we always ask, who's, who are the newcomers to 60 Minutes in Space tonight? Okay, we always get about, it looks like about 10 or 15 or so. Anyway, the, the emphasis of this program is always to tell you about the latest and greatest things happening in space science. So uh, it is a pleasure to do it solo to, uh, this particular month because you probably heard of the big announcement of the detection of gravity waves. <laughs> So I'm going to devote the whole talk, actually, to that topic in a, in a little story that's, uh, uh, that is very related uh, to, to that. So uh, anyway, I'm dying to get, back, get into it, and I've got a lot of good stuff to show you. And at the end of the talk, uh, there will be time for questions and things like that. But if you do have a burning question during the talk when the slide's up, just yell it out, and I'll try to point, uh, point some things out if, uh, if you do that. OK, so let's get started. And um, first, a very quick primer. And, and in terms of understanding gr uh, gravity waves, uh, we have to understand a little bit about how Einstein viewed gravity. Gravity is not a force, but mass actually uh, bends space and time. And an object like you see here, Earth, going around, or well, it would be going around the sun here, uh, both of these affect what we call space time, which is shown to be curved here in this lower uh, sheet down here. And you can see even the Earth is curving its own little bit of a space time. And so there's not a force between these two as Earth goes around, but the fact that Earth is moving in this curved space-time that makes it go around in an orbit around the sun. Okay, so is that... Three-dimensional, is it? So uh, th these are always hard graphics to actually show. And so uh, this is showing three-dimensional how the Earth and, and, the, and the sun look, but not, of course, to scale. Uh, but this is just representing not a bending in three-dimensional space, but a bending in uh, four-dimensional space, which is the three dimensions of space and the dimension of time. So it's a visualization. So you can think of that kind of as a rubber sheet. You're bending space-time, and things roll around that rubber sheet and are in orbit around the object. Now, we're going to be talking about gra gravity waves, and this particular situation doesn't produce any gravity waves because things are still things well we have the earth that's actually moving so it does produce a little bit of gravity waves but in general if we have the sun just sitting there it will not put off any gravitational waves it's only when you have objects moving and changing the fabric of space-time that you get the emission of gravity waves Well, the, 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 the sun spins as well, so that does have a factor, and I'll touch on that a little bit. And I just wanted to kind of, I mean, this is a momentous thing in the sense that uh, Einstein uh, predicted the existence of gravitational waves way back when he uh, came up with the theory of general relativity back in like 1915. So we're a little over 100 years for the actual direct detection of gravity waves. And there's so many things that have come out of Einstein's uh, theory that, you know, over time we verified every one of them. Uh, and, and that like, it, w this is, I'll get to it later, this is not a discovery, it's a detection. But other things that Einstein predicted uh, were the bending of starlight around uh, light. So light also follows this curved space and looks as though it is curved and so a famous uh, experiment by Sir Arthur Eddington in like uh, eight, uh, 1919 uh, where he looked at stars in an eclipse close to the sun verified the predictions uh, of Einstein. Another prediction of Einstein's is that as light is emitted from uh, say uh, a body like the earth and this was originally a uh, uh, confirmed in like 1959 in measurements in a tower at Harvard University. Uh, as light climbs out of uh, a gravitational well, so to speak, that light gets loses energy and, and therefore is redshifted. So that was another measure of it. Uh, we've also, this is 
tied to the fact that our feet are a little bit younger than our head because time is also part of this equation of things that get bent and time runs slower for my feet than for my head. And there's a very famous experiment in which we have flown atomic clocks in airlines and verified that the clock that's in the airplane actually runs a little bit faster than the one that's on the ground. All our GPS units have to rely on all that information for us to get the directions that we do here on the ground. So I mentioned that this is just a detection and not a discovery. So the discovery of gravitational waves was actually verified back in the 70s when we discovered a pulsar system rotating around uh, actually another neutron star. This little uh, artist's conception shows it around a, a white dwarf. But we have very close uh, stars going around one another. It, that's when you start making ripples in the pond, so to speak, and sending out gravitational waves. And when you send out gravitational waves like that, you are losing energy in the system. And so, therefore, uh, two objects that are orbiting start to in-spiral uh, or spiral down toward one another. And with a pulsar... Uh, it, as one of the objects in the system, you can actually measure that uh, how quickly it is actually spiraling down. It's very, very slow, but for the, the first system uh, in the 70s, they were able to measure it and exactly agreed with uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity. And the people who discovered it, Taylor and Holtz, I believe, uh, got the Nobel Prize for that in the, in the early 90s uh, for that discovery. So... We have since actually discovered other systems. In particular, there is an object of two pulsars that are rotating around one another, meaning they're both uh, these neutron stars. They're very, uh, uh, very compact objects. Imagine taking the whole mass of the sun and squeezing it in down to the size of uh, Denver, basically. I heard a new one. You know, they always talk about a teaspoon weighing a whole bunch. Uh, a teaspoon of a neutron star would weigh as much as the human population. Okay. Um, so uh, anyway, the, we've seen these other systems, and that has this was a uh, double pulsar system was discovered. I remember I was here at the museum, and I think it was 2004, 2003, and that was exciting because we now know that there are these kind of systems that are out there. So giving us hope that we can actually detect gravitational uh, waves. Now, there were some other experiments back in like in uh, uh, t uh, t 2004. I don't know if any of you guys remember an experiment called Gravity Probe B. It was a pretty exciting one. It was testing a few things of general relativity. It was doing uh, something called geodetic precession and another thing called frame uh, dragging. And let me, this is a simpler graphic I'm going to show here. Uh, but... The fact that space is actually warped around the Earth, we flew a satellite here, and as it continues to go around, if you have some really accurate gyroscopes, which this did, it had the always pointing at this particular star, I am Pegasi, and um, over orbits and orbits and things, it, it would start to drift due to the fact that time is warped or space is warped around the Earth. It also measured another thing called frame dragging because the Earth just spinning is mass changing its position, right? It's not the same object. So what this graphic is illustrating is notice how it's dragging the lines of the, of the curved space around with it. And we'll get back a little bit to that later, but it's not very severe with uh, the Earth, but it's another prediction of general relativity, and this spacecraft was actually able to measure that with pretty high accuracy. Not as high as it had hoped because it had some other noise, and they're still actually reducing the data on that. Now, the thing that this particular instrument had, it was just really cool to talk about, is it had these very highly polished spheres uh, that they used in their gyroscopes for about two inches ar around and here's uh, showing the mechanism So here's one of these spheres here and it sat in this little body here and it spun without touching the walls when it was out in space And so it's the gyroscope and it's always maintaining that same orientation and what they were measuring is the drift from that as it 
was changed around in gravity. These were at the time the most highly polished spheres ever made. And they were so round that if you were to enlarge these to the size of the earth, the highest mountain, the lowest valley would be about eight feet tall. Okay, that's how smooth these things were. And I think two of them uh, that they had made for this mission are still the, the most highly polished uh, surfaces. I had to show this image because it was really fun just to look around at just different things that people were talking about in gravity on the, on the web. And this was a uh, gallery exhibit in Istanbul. They're showing the curvature of space and time. It's wild. I want to go see it. I get a little dizzy. I don't see anybody is thrown up on the ground here at all. <laughs> but it might cause some of that. Okay, well, let's get into uh, the discovery of the gravita or not discovery, the detection of the gravitational waves. And I just wanted to show the movie that uh, the LIGO people put out on there because it shows the scientists and the people who really deserve all the credit for the work on this. LIGO stands for the Laser Interferometer <clears throat> Gravitational Wave Observatory. LIGO is really two observatories that work in unison in tandem. The LIGO interferometer has arms that are about two and a half miles long, four kilometers. We have a laser. The laser produces the purest light you can possibly make. It produces light that's so coherent that it's capable of detecting gravitational waves. We have these very massive mirrors. They weigh 40 kilograms, which is 88 pounds. They're about this thick, and they're just the purest material you can imagine. The NSF, of course, had to be the source of funding for anything that would be as expensive as this. This was going to be a, a, a very high-risk experiment. It, it, it was from its very inception. If you think about this in the 70s and 80s, I'm amazed at how bold it was to do this and, and visionary. It was bold and visionary. There's no other way to describe it. NSF management, the National Science Board, they had to really step up to, to that. And they had a lot of discussions, brought in a lot of experts. There was great debate going on. But in the end, the uh, people who thought it could be done won the day, and they went after it. Gravitational waves were predicted by Einstein uh, about 100 years ago, and they are dynamical perturbations in the fabric of space-time, ripples in space-time, if you will. A ripple in the fabric of space and time, the same way as a ripple on a pond is a ripple in the shape of the surface of uh, the water. Nobody really believed that you could ever detect them because the size of the effect is so small. One thousandth the diameter of a proton. Even Einstein himself never thought a detection would be possible. Well, I tried to do this back in the 1960s when I was a student. Uh, we couldn't make any progress. We didn't have the technology. The idea was extremely simple, and it turns out to be the basis of LIGO. What the gravitational wave does, it stretches space this way and compresses space that way. So you exploit that property. Put one object here and another object over there, and let the gravitational wave go through that system, and it'll change the space between these by contracting that one and extending that one. And I came to the conclusion that if you make this long enough, if you didn't make it a little pipsqueak thing like this, but you made it sort of kilometer <laughs> scale, you could probably get these extremely precise measurements. Nobody had ever made something like this before, so there was a lot of technological challenges that needed to be overcome. The precision that was required it was, it was just amazing, mind-boggling. The MIT group has typically concentrated on developing new techniques to make the instruments work and then to work on also data analysis algorithms that are well informed by the understanding of the instrument. We have observed gravitational waves from two black holes forming a larger black hole. Two black holes 
merging together, literally nearly the speed of light, to produce a bigger black hole. How cool is that? I said, holy mackerel. Well, this is the beginning of a whole new way of studying the universe. It's monumental. <laughs> it's like Galileo using the telescope for the first time. Every time we have pointed a new instrument into the sky, nature has revealed secrets to us that we haven't known before. And so I feel very confident that this is just the beginning of such an era for gravitational wave observations as well. Who knows what we'll see. I would love to see Einstein's face if he could read this article that we just put out. I mean, he would have been as dumbfounded as we are because it's a wonderful proof that all of this incredible stuff, a strong field gravity, is in his equations. Just imagine that. To me, that's a miracle that that happened. Man's thinking, and also all the elegance, the, the, not only in the theory, but the elegance in the experiment. I mean, that is a human endeavor that I think everybody in the world should be proud of. I had to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so it's just an amazing accomplishment. I mean, over 20 years in just building this thing, and you think back to the people who originally started working on trying to detect it, they didn't have a chance in heck to, to really detect it when they first started on doing this. And so it was just in this last year were they able to, to get to that point. So I want to go into some of the details of things that you actually heard in, the, in that uh, video. One is the signal that they actually measure. Uh, they showed it uh, here. Um, and this is kind of the amplitude that they measure. And then this is over the time. So the measure of this particular gravitational wave coming by is less than a second of, of time there. And here is the, uh, and you can see the theoretical uh, of curves underlying the, the detectors they measure. They measured it at the two stations they have, uh, the one in uh, uh, Washington and the one in uh, Louis uh, Louisiana. Uh, and identical signals, they are shifted in time because they arrive there at different times. So, and you also saw that it was actually detected in September 14th, and I will get to that a little bit as well. So I'm gonna just play that little video that they showed these two, that's the sound of it naturally, and that's sped up by a factor of 100. So you can actually hear the audio bleep, which is the sound of that. And it was very interesting when they detected this because it happened in September 14th. They had just uh, put in their upgrades for the new detection. Uh, they're basically isolating these mirrors even better. So they increased the, or lowered the noise basically. And uh, you could see this data in the raw data. And so it was amazing they were able to keep this all hush-hush. There were rumors about it actually floating out there. To avoid that, they, they actually introduce false signals into the data so that people don't run out and say, oh, we just detected something. So uh, they... But everyone knew that that false detection, since so they were just doing the upgrade, and in fact it really hadn't been turned on, uh, knew that those false detections weren't being introduced. So they knew this was a real signal. And they had to spend a bunch of time to make sure that someone wasn't pulling a hoax or anything like that. The fact that it was detected at two stations made it very, very hard for them to do it. And the detection level was so high that uh, it's... Uh, there was no question that it was a detection. Uh, it was. It could not have been a random event. I mean, like point zero 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 zero, with many zeros, one percent that it was just a random occurrence. But it it, it hadn't even been turned on yet at this point in in official run. Uh, so yeah, can you guess which one's in Louisiana and which one's in Eastern Washington? Okay, <laughs> so these are the two stations there, and I wanted to just. Uh, look at some of the other things that were shown in the video and that is how they actually detect those signals and you saw the lasers and things and so I've got another video here I believe oh before I show that uh, so 
the way the wave travels is an interesting thing where he talked about it in, in the video there that space expands in one direction and compresses in the other and you use that to your advantage and that's why they're the two arms of the interferometer because one is compressing and the other one is expanding and they're measuring those distance changes between the two. And so here's the video of the interferometer. You have these laser beams that come down and then they recombine and you have that kind of motion when a gravity wave actually goes by. So, but just looking at the laser beams, it's a very pure light, has the exact same wavelength. You split it off into two beams. One hits the one mirror on one leg that's two and a half miles down and the one hits the other legs. And when they come back together, they actually combine 180 degrees out of phase. So they totally cancel one another out. And so on the detector that you see on the right there, they would measure no signal. Now, when a gravity wave comes by, it shifts those and gets them the line and you see a little bit of light. And that is the detection that they actually made there. So the amazing thing is the wavelength of light is, um, is fairly large compared to the, uh, the size of which they measured this spatial deflection. And I will show in this next one, they talked about it being this one thousandth of an atom. Here's an atom at a tenth of a billionth of a meter across. And you have to zoom in this much to get to the nucleus of the atom, eight orders of magnitude, and that's how much the amount of space actually shifted. It's incomprehensible that we can measure something to that accuracy. In this next video I show, it actually shows that when it passed by Earth, because these have set wavelengths and things like that as they pass by, the Earth moves within that changing space as well. And this will be very exaggerated in terms of how much the Earth moved when it was under uh, the influence of this gravitational wave. So I, I'm, I don't think anybody felt this rocking going on <laughs> there. And, and the, the last part of it is gets very, very, and it's a neat thing about the gravity waves is the very last part of it is very, very intense there. So as it uh, moves through. And so I was going to give you another analogy of the immense distances because we really don't have a comprehension of the, 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 the how minute of measurement that they actually made. So the distance between the Earth and the Sun is 92 million miles. Okay, if we got in a airplane which, and flew to the Sun, it'd take us about 30 years to get there. So 92 million miles is a long ways away. The nearest star is about 250,000 times greater than that distance. So it would take us about 10 million years to get on our airplane to get to the nearest star. In the vast space between us and the nearest star, the amount of deflection in space that we were able to measure with this measurement was the width of a human hair over basically four light years distance. Okay. So it, it just boggles my mind that we have the accuracy. And this deflection was about a factor of 10 greater than their sensitivity there. So they could have measured something that was about 10 times less oscillation. Okay. And the other thing that they were able actually to get from this <clears throat> is that because they knew the delay time and how the, 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 things are oriented at the two different sites, they can actually pin down what direction of space this uh, came from. Now, it's not a real small section of space. In fact, it's about 1% of the sky there, but they knew in general it came from the southern hemisphere, and this represents that we know that about 90% probability it was within this purple, and about 10% uh, probability it was within uh, that uh, this area over here. Now, ultimately, we're going to get better abilities uh, to confine that because we have other systems that are going to come online. And so here are the gravitational wave ground-based observatories. Here are the two uh, LIGO ones. Uh, there is a uh, uh, this one I actually don't know too much about, but it doesn't have the sensitivity. But this one, which is under construction, is going to be pretty soon. It's uh, called Virgo. Uh, it's going to be up to snuff with the other ones, with the upgrades and having the same sensitivity. So with three of them, they can really pinpoint 
better what direction of space it came from. Now, we haven't heard anything about any kind of supernova or anything else going on in that particular area of sky, but 1% on the sky is huge, and so chances are we didn't have a telescope looking in, in that particular uh, direction. And, and, and a lot of times, all you're getting are gravity waves. You're not getting any other kind of radiation that would have come from that direction, and that's one of the things that will ultimately uh, get from that. Here's that one that's uh, the Virgo one. I think think it's cool. It's very close to Pisa, where uh, you know uh, Galileo dropped his uh, things off the Leaning Tower, and uh, so it's kind of appropriate that they're doing gravity. And I was reading something about how gravity was uh, 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 the fact that gravity works the way it d does is something Galileo might have came up with. You had a question? Do people in Europe call it Lego? Uh, I have no idea, actually. <laughs> so I've only heard people call it LIGO here. Uh, so what is the significance of, you know, they only made one discovery here, but this is very, very significant. One, it's almost proof positive that black holes exist because you do not get that radiation until the event horizons, that's kind of the point where light cannot escape from a black hole. That's when they're touching. And I'll show you the nice video of these two as they spiral in uh, that they created later on in the talk. Uh, so this is, you know, because all our other evidence of black holes is somewhat indirect. We, you know, we see things falling into black holes and they heat up and they create X-ray sources and things like that. But we don't have anything that that's close to the actual event horizon of a of a black hole. The other thing that was significant is that the masses of these two black holes, one was about 28 and the other one was about 33 times the mass of the sun, are very massive black holes. All the stellar sized black holes that we found in our Milky Way galaxy are have been on, on the order of 10 to 15 solar masses and mainly detected by the fact that they're in a binary system and pulling mass from that binary companion and heating it up before it falls into the black hole in a, what's called an accretion disk and we detect x-rays from that. But we haven't seen anything this massive even though it's predicted that they might have actually formed at this particular mass. Now uh, it, ones that form of this kind of mass probably have what we call a, a very low metallicity. A, me, metals are anything heavier than hydrogen and helium, and they're created in the cores of stars. And as the, each next generation of star is born, it has a heavier, it has more and more metal, metallicity associated with it. Metals make stars when they reach the end of their life lose a lot of their material. So stars, the most massive stars probably fo form at maybe 100 solar masses or so, and they lose a lot of their materials. For things to form 30 solar masses, they can't have a lot of metals, but these ones did. So it's very, it, it, it was very good to know that these objects actually exist out there. The other thing is that binaries are consisted of, uh, that they form in these binary systems. So we... Ultimately, as we have more detections, we may get a little bit of handle on that particular mechanism. Do they form as a binary black hole system, or does a black hole system in a star-forming region actually sink to the center and then capture another large black hole that was formed in that same star-forming region? So we don't know, but gravity waves will ultimately uh, shed some light on that because we can also tell how the spins are oriented of the black holes. And the other thing is that there's sufficient time for these binary systems to have actually inspiraled and collided with one another. There's no guarantee of that. I mean, if the black holes are too far separated, they will not they lose gravitational waves at enough, enough energy to eventually spiral down there in the age of the universe that we have. So this one happened uh, about a billion light years away. The age of the universe is 14 billion years old. So in other words, it happened a billion years ago, but it happened 13 billion years after the universe uh, was born in the Big Bang. So it took a while for this system to actually spiral in. So that's uh, another cool thing. And so uh, the, uh, the other thing that's just really neat about these massive black holes that we'll be able to study, we didn't know whether they formed and everything, is 
are they associated with supernova? You know, when they first started doing this first supernova models, we start off with a, a blue supergiant and then you get a collapse and you form a, a supernova. We couldn't actually get the models to explode in these stars. Someone would just collapse because a, a, a star at the end of its life is run out of energy and that core collapses into a black hole. It's only the rebound and other materials rushing in that create the supernova blast. Well, it's possible that supernovas can form and there's no supernova explosion. And it's possible that's how these ones actually formed. And it's possible that when these two merged, there was no actual fireworks that could have been seen visually uh, there. <coughs> so a lot of cool things about uh, supernova and uh, things. The other thing that was neat about this, I know this is a graph and everything like this, but what this is showing here is here's the mass of the combined system. So these were both about 30 solar masses. So here is the mass of that system along this axis right here. So don't pay any attention, it's way up here. Just kind of draw a line over here. And this is just showing how much volume of space they have increased by increasing the sensitivity of the LIGO detector from 2010, which was way down here, to uh, where we're at right now on this yellow curve right here. And then the projected sensitivity is almost another fact of uh, a 10 here in the next two to three years, putting us up to this curve. And so we're about here with this particular object. Here we are on the yellow right here at this point. If we go over to here, we get the volume of space is about 10 to the zero. 10 to the zero is one. And the units of this is cubic gigaparsecs, okay? A gigaparsec uh, is about 3 billion light years across. So this is talking about a volume of space, 3 billion by 3 billion by 3 billion gigaparsecs. Uh, or, I mean, uh, uh, 3 billion by 3 uh, giga or billion light years there. So w this particular detection has been able to sample about a giga uh, uh, parsec cubed of space. And this one object was on the order of a, uh, about 300 million light years, uh, oh, I was a billion uh, light years away, which is about a third of a gigaparsec. So this gives us some statistics of how often these objects actually go off. So it's pretty big error bars because they've only detected one, but we think that there's, uh, in that scale, there's anywhere from a few to a few hundred that are going off of this type of object, meaning that we're going to be able to detect quite a few of these with LIGO at its present day sensitivity. And then when they improve it in three years, we're going to be detecting even fainter objects and objects that are actually closer. You extend that volume of space and the more and more objects you'll actually be able to study.